All right, so uh, today we have uh, Elena Asensio, who's going to be talking to us uh, about some work that she's done during her master's. Uh, she is currently a PhD student at the University of Bonn, where she also did her uh, master's. And today she's going to be talking to us about the tidal stability of Fornax cluster dwarf galaxies in Newtonian and Melkormian uh, dynamics. So whenever you're ready, take it away. Hi, uh, thanks for presenting me and for really reading the long title. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, today I'm going to talk about the tidal stability of the Fornax cluster dwarf galaxies, both in Newtonian and in Melkorm dynamics. Uh, so, for starters, I will just give a bit of introduction about the topic. So, dwarf galaxies, according to the Lambda CDM parting, um, can be classified in two types regarding their origin. So, if they formed in by the collapse of dark matter particles into halos, which then accreted baryonic matter and yeah, formed the first galaxy, uh, dwarf galaxies, they would be primordial. And if they formed in the tidal tails that arise in the interaction of uh, galaxies, like more massive galaxies, they would be tidal and well, therefore, depending on what's their origin, they will also have different properties. So for example, if the dwarf galaxies are primordial, they will still have their dark matter halo and they will be distributed in an approximately spheroidal way around galaxies and galaxy clusters. On the other hand, we have that if the origin of this uh, dwarf galaxies is tidal, they will be dark matter free as the velocity dispersion of the dark matter particles is not fast enough, it's, it's way too fast to be accreted uh, by the substructures in the tidal tail. And because they don't have this cocoon of dark matter, they would also be very fragile and very rare. And that's, that's for the, that's the classification regarding the, the origin, and the, but they can also be classified regarding the morphology. Uh, so if we classify them in, Regarding the morphology, they can either be late types. This is that they have active star formation rate, well, active star formation. And this would include, for example, irregulars. And they can also be early types, which are the ones which still don't have an active star formation. So this would be ellipticals and spheroidals. Um, spheroidal galaxies have the particularity that they have these very low stellar masses but they have very high velocity dispersions. So from this very low mass, we would expect that their potential well, well that they form is very small, and therefore it's very hard to understand how, uh, how can these very fast rotating star, uh, stars in their outskirts not escape this potential well. So one way of understanding this is saying, okay, perhaps these spherical dwarf galaxies have a dark matter halo which is making their potential well a bit deeper. If that was the case, this would make spheroidal dwarf galaxies primordial uh, dwarf galaxies. And therefore we would also expect them to be distributed in an approximately spheroidal way. Uh, the thing is that when we observe dwarf galaxies, uh, we see that they are not distributed in a spheroidal way, they are actually distributed forming planes of satellites. And this is a bit against the fact that they are primordial. Uh, so in the context of Lambda CDM, we would only have one option left, and this is that they are of tidal origin. But if they are of tidal origin, they, are, they, they won't be able to, to have a dark matter halo. And if they don't have a dark matter halo, how can you explain the and the fast velocity dispersions and the low mass. So here is where Milgromian dynamics comes in. So in 1983, uh, Milgrom proposed a theory or a way of explaining the discrepancy between the uh, gravity inferred from the velocity dispersions in the galaxies and that inferred from the baryonic mass. It was a way of explaining this uh, without resorting to saying that galaxies have a colder matter halo. 
And the way that Mont does this is by postulating that Newtonian gravi gravity receives like a boost uh, in the limit of low accelerations. This is when t is smaller than a constant a0. Therefore, uh, when we're in this regime, this is the Mont regime, gravity would scale as one over r instead of one r squared as is in Newtonian dynamics. So the way that uh, Mondian gravity and Newtonian gravity is related is by the interpolating function. The way this interpolating function works is, so let's say that Gn is significantly larger than a0, therefore the, interpol the interpolating function will tend to one and gravity will equal Newtonian gravity. Uh, the other way around, if uh, Newtonian gravity is way, way smaller than a sub zero, this, so this term will be equal to square root of A sub zero A over Dn. And this whole term would be equal to this term over here, which is the gravity in the deep Mont regime. Uh, regarding the actual form of the interpolating function, um, in here we use the simple interpolating function because it, at least up to now, it seems to be the form of this function that better fits observations. So as you can see, if you plot this whole term in here, um, your Poisson equation is no longer linear. And therefore, when you try to solve this, uh, you get like extra terms that do not appear uh, in Newtonian or in, general, or in general relativity. And these additional terms have like its own effect somehow. So, because of this, we would have uh, the external field effect in MOND. What this external field effect says is that the internal dynamics of an object can be affected by the presence of a uniform external field. Uh, this is actually uh, not, what, uh, <laughs> not what Newtonian or general relativity uh, says. So it's something from MOND. Uh, so how can dwarf galaxies help us test which theory of gravity or which model is the correct model, MOND or lambda CDM. Uh, so the way dwarf galaxies can help us in this is, uh, for example, in MOND, we would have that the dwarf galaxy has a higher self-gravity because of the boost to Newtonian gravity that the MOND provides. And in Lambda CDM, we would have that the slope gravity of dwarf is also higher than in just Newtonian dynamics because this dwarf would be surrounded by a dark matter hill, which would give it more mass. Uh, now, the difference is that uh, as in Mond, as the dwarf approaches the main galaxy, the external field, uh, the, the external field of the galaxy dominates over the gravitational field of the dwarf and this makes the dwarf be more Newtonian and therefore it will lose this boost to gravity given by Mond. Uh, while in the CDM, the dwarf will still have its star matter halo and same will happen. Uh, therefore, we can see a major difference between uh, Mond and, and Lambda CDM in this case. Uh, and is that dwarf galaxies will be more disturbed by tides in Mond than in Lambda CDM because this external field effect that the dwarfs experience in Mond. Uh, so now we should ask ourselves, what do dwarf galaxies actually look like? So to answer this question, in this project, we have like focused on the Fornax Deep Survey Catalog. So the Fornax cluster is the second nearest galaxy cluster to us, and it contains dwarfs with different masses, distances, shapes, is very useful in that sense for studying the properties of the dwarfs. Uh, so also the, also the catalog contains a lot of dwarf galaxies, 564. And most of these dwarf galaxies are uh, dwarf ellipticals and dwarf spheroidals, which in the catalog are classified as the same type since they are very similar. Another property of this catalog is that it's capable of observing a down to a very faint dwarf galaxies, which is an improvement with respect to previous uh, surveys of the Fornax cluster. 
And in this catalog, dwarfs are already visually classified as either undisturbed, which you like seen in this picture, possibly or mildly disturbed or very disturbed or unclear. So in our analysis, uh, we consider these two types of, as just disturbed to simplify things. Uh, something else that we do in, an, in our analysis is we remove a late type dwarfs because these are probably not in the cluster, they just contamination from outside. Um, we also remove dwarfs who are in clear morphology because they are not going to be very useful for the classification. And we remove dwarfs at a projected distance uh, higher than 800 kiloparsecs, uh, since they are probably not orbiting the central galaxy cluster, the, the central galaxy in the cluster. Um, this leaves us with a total number of dwarfs of 353, which is still good enough for the statistics. And we make sure that we have the right dwarfs. Uh, so now we go back to theory. And we say, OK, so these dwarf galaxies will be in this cluster and they will be subject to several gravitational interactions that are going to affect their structure. And to, to just name some of the most important effects that can affect the dwarfs in this sense, uh, first one would be harassment, which is the disruption in the dwarf structure due to, due to interactions with massive galaxies. Um, so this is given in Bini and Tremaine, and it looks kind of similar for, for Lambda CDM and for Mont. The main difference is that in Lambda CDM, you have to account for the stellar mass plus uh, dark matter halo mass when you see the mass terms. And in Mont, you have to substitute the gravitational, uh, the Newtonian gravitational constant because you're not longer working in, in Newtonian dynamics. So this would be the effective G in Mont. A uh, second effect that could affect the, um, the properties of the dwarfs is the tidal disruption, which is the disruption from the cluster's tidal field. So if we defined the tidal radius as the radius at which the gravitational force of the, of the cluster of tides starts dominating over the gravitational force of the dwarf, we have that at our tidal, the gravity of the dwarf should be about the same as the gravity of the cluster. And just brief note, the gravity of the cluster is uh, an observed one, not one calculated theoretically. So it would be the same for Mont and Lambda CDM. So uh, given this sort of intuitive equation, um, we define a tidal radius for Mont and Lambda CDM uh, just by solving the equation for our title. Um, so once again, we we account in the Lambda CDM part that we have a dark matter halo, and we account for uh, an effective AG that will be different from the Newtonian one in, in Mond, and also for some factors that account for the influence of the dwarf shape in, in the calculation of the tidal force. And yeah, just a side note, uh, since the dwarf is going to be mostly affected by the cluster tidal field at pericenter, we will always calculate the tidal radius at pericenter because we want to see the dwarf when it's more likely to be disturbed. And um, now that we have this defined, we can actually define what is the tidal susceptibility of the dwarf to these effects. Uh, so in the case of uh, tidal susceptibility from harassment, uh, we compare the disruption time scale with the age of the four NAX uh, dwarfs. So um, we have that the disruption time scale is way larger than the age of these dwarfs, that eta harassment will be very small and the dwarf will not be very affected by harassment. The other way around, if the disruption time scale is way smaller than the age of the four next uh, dwarfs, this tidal susceptibility is going to be very high and the dwarf will be very affected by harassment. Uh, same thing goes for the tidal susceptibility from the cluster tidal field. Uh, in this case, we're actually comparing the half mass radius, which is a radius containing half or the total luminous mass of the object with the tidal radius, which I defined before. 
So what happens in this case is, uh, let's say that your dwarf has a very strong self gravity, either because it has a dark matter halo or because it's in deep moon regime. Because of this, uh, the point at which the um, cluster uh, uh, cluster tidal field will start dominating of that of the dwarf will be very far away from the from dwarf center. And because of this, you will have that our title is going to be very high. And if our title is very high, you can intuitively see that the title susceptibility is going to be very small. And on the opposite case, uh, we could have a dwarf that has very little self-gravity, either because it's like purely Newtonian or because it's a mount dwarf uh, affected by a very strong external field. So uh, in this case, the G dwarf would be very small and our tidal will then also be very small, will be very close to the dwarf center. And if this is very small, tidal susceptibility will be very, very large to the point where if uh, tidal radius is way, way smaller than half mass radius, the dwarf is going to get destroyed. So um, now, we now that we have the definitions of tidal susceptibility, we apply it to the dwarfs that we have in the Fornax catalog, and we construct these histograms. So we do this first for the tidal susceptibility from Harzman, and we also do this for the tidal susceptibility from the cluster tidal field. Um, just by giving a quick look at the numbers, first thing you might notice is that uh, tidal susceptibility from Harzman is practically neglectable compared to the susceptibility from the cluster tidal field, field, like this is way stronger. Uh, so uh, from now on, we're just, when we talk to, about tidal susceptibility, we're just going to talk about tidal susceptibility from the cluster tidal field because that's the most relevant one. Another thing you might notice by quickly looking at these numbers is that tidal susceptibility in MOND is about five times higher than in London CDM which like I was saying before, this is kind of what we were expecting because most dwarfs are more susceptible to tides. Uh, next step would actually be saying this is, these are the tidal susceptibility values that are routine, in, that are routine for the dwarfs. Uh, now we want to compare them with how do the dwarfs actually look like. This is we want to check. So this dwarf that has a very high tidal susceptibility look disturbed. Uh, I mean, ideally the answer should be yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's what we want to check. So um, like, I, like I was saying, we expect that four next dwarfs with an eta higher than 0 0.5 or one will be tidally disturbed. This is if the tidal radius is about the same order as the half mass radius, the dwarf is likely to be disturbed because has very high tidal susceptibility. Um, so to do this, we plot the fraction of disturbed galaxies against the tidal susceptibility. And well, we do we first do this for the CDM, and what we see is that um, at very low um, tidal susceptibility values, we see that the dwarfs are already being classified as disturbed. So maybe just a 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. They are already very disturbed. And we also see that uh, there are no more dwarfs at tidal susceptibility values at which the dwarf shouldn't be destroyed because tidal susceptibility is not that large. And we do the exact same thing for Mond and kind of the opposite happens. So we see that um, a dwarfs start being classified as disturbed at an eta value slightly higher than expected. And also they still appear at very high uh, eta values. So, so yeah, the conclusion of this would be on the one hand, uh, it does seem that Mond is doing kind of better than Lana City him, like at least it's closer to the one value that is expected. But before we want to, I mean, we don't want to jump into conclusions. So first we have to say, okay, maybe these results are affected by projection effects, or maybe this is not the most accurate way of 
pinpointing the tidal susceptibility. So to account for these things, um, we go to the next step, which is building a forward model. And by building a forward model, I mean that we did a um, particle simulation, a test particle simulation of the Fornax, of the Fornax system of flows. Uh, so basically to do this simulation, we just took a grid of several initial distances, several eccentricities and tried like all possible combinations to make like all possible orbits. And in each of these orbits, we actually just record the, the eta max uh, to see uh, yeah, what's the eta max in each orbit. Also to account for projection effects, which I said before was one of the reasons why we wanted to do this test. And we also consider that these swaps are seen under all possible angles. Like we also account for that possibility. So um, next step, now that we have all the orbits, is assigning probabilities to the orbits. And by this, I mean that we, we consider a certain um, radial distribution of the orbits or distances from the center. We also consider an eccentricity distribution of the orbits and the distribution of the disturbed fraction as a function of tidal susceptibility. So these three things are going to depend on several parameters, as you might see. And since we want to make our simulation as similar as possible to the actual Fornax system, what we're going to do is leave as three parameters all these terms that you're seeing and, well, going to explain them a little bit better in here. But yeah, the idea is to leave them as free parameters so that we can fit, uh, fit them to the observational data that we have. So our free parameters are going to be, on the one hand, our core, which is the radius of the constant, of the constant density central region of the Fornax cluster, this is like center. And we're also going to have a slope PR, which is the power, sl power slope of the dwarf radial distribution in the cluster outskirts. This is outside our core, a uh, slope P, which is the slope of the eccentricity probability distribution, minimum eta disturbance, which is the lowest eta value at which the dwarf is disturbed, eta destruction, which is the eta value at which the dwarf is destroyed, as its name says, uh, P disturbance floor, which is the minimum probability for a dwarf to appear disturbed if eta is smaller than minimum eta disturbance. Um, this is the probability that the dwarf is destroyed by something which is not the cluster tides. Uh, so for example, due to a symmetry star formation, it could look, uh, it, it could look uh, disturbed because of that. And then P uh, disturbed ceiling, which is a probability for a dwarf to be disturbed right before it gets destroyed at eta equals eta destruction. So these are our three parameters, and this would be our observational constraints, which are the projected distance of the dwarfs to the center of the cluster, the distribution of eta values, the distribution of tidal susceptibility of the dwarfs, and the disturbed fraction of dwarfs as a function of uh, eta. And well, we did this obviously for Lancidium and for Mond. Uh, so yeah, I'm already giving here the best result, and as you can see, uh, both Land—I mean, both Lander CDM and Mond work fairly well with our algorithm. It managed to fit both models fairly well to observations, um, but for very different values uh, in in the free parameters. Like free parameters don't have the same values in Lander CDM and Mond. Um, so that takes me to step four, which uh, I mean, the, the way we actually did this fit to observations was using a Markov chain Monte Carlo method. And with this, we actually found the set of simulation parameter values that maximize the probability of matching the observed population. Uh, so yeah, the good thing about the Markov chain Monte Carlo is that it not only gives you the best fit model, but also uh, gives you the range of values that could kind of fit the observations for a certain confidence regency somehow. And this is kind of what is summarized in this triangular plot. So 
in, in, in the form of counter plots and histograms. So yeah, in, in each plot, you can actually see that what is the range of values with one sigma confidence that can sort of match the observations for each of the three parameters that we left. So among these little squares, I wanted to say focus on this one, which compares uh, minimum eta, eta disturbance with eta destruction. And yeah, basically what this is telling us is that eta destruction in MONT, this is a tidal susceptibility at which we expect dwarfs to be destroyed in MONT, is somewhere between one point something, three point something in the one sigma region. And it's between 0 0.2, 0 0.3 in Lambda CDM. Um, so like we said before, if we expect that the dwarves get destroyed when the half mass radius is about the same order as tidal radius, this is when eta destruction equals one. Um, so we have that Mont is working significantly better than Lambda CDM in this aspect. Uh, one thing that you might be asking is that, hold on, but this plot was made assuming that the dwarfs look disturbed because of tides from the cluster. What if they are not disturbed from the, tides, uh, from the cluster tides? Um, so if you remember, we actually defined a variable in the, in the MCMC, which is PD's floor to account for the probability that a dwarf is, is disturbed by something which is not the cluster tides. And the algorithm gave it uh, like very low probability values. And moreover, if we compare um, p disturb uh, floor with p disturb ceiling, what we actually see is that uh, the algorithm identifies a rising trend. This is the algorithm actually identifying that the higher tidal susceptibility to cluster tides, the higher is the probability that we observe the dwarf being uh, uh, disturbed. Uh, therefore, we have reasons to believe that the cluster tides are the actual reason why these dwarfs look perturbed. Um, so yeah, I mean, this was like a new test that we did. So yeah, <laughs> there goes that. Um, so this whole time we've been saying, okay, so we we should assume that um, it's a, I, about one is the stability threshold because it's sort of intuitive, but maybe it's not the case. So to check if this is actually the case, what we do is we perform n-body simulations, first in MONT. And what we do is uh, we, we give a certain initial position for the dwarf, and we give it a certain eccentricity, and we estimate what is the tidal susceptibility at pre-center. So we repeat this simulation that you're seeing here for different um, eccentricities. The higher the eccentricity, the closer it's going to get to pericenter and the higher it's going to be eta max. And we see at which eta is the dwarf being disturbed. Uh, so how do we know when is the dwarf destroyed? Um, so to answer this question, we actually look at different properties of the dwarfs. This is the aspect ratio or the velocity dispersion and the half mass radius. So in the Mont case, what we expect in even in the even in the dwarfs that don't get so close to the center is that as the dwarf uh, gets like in the proximity of the, of the cluster center, um, it will start to be affected by the external field effect. And this will sort of affect its structure just from the sort of sudden injection of energy somehow. And the difference between a dwarf that survives and a dwarf that gets destroyed is that a dwarf that survives this passage through pericenter is going to have an adiabatic response. This is that it's going to go through pericenter. It's going to be a little bit affected, like you can see maybe in some of the plots, solid plots. 
But then after it leaves presenter is going to go back to how it looked before. But if, it, if the dwarf is destroyed, what will happen is that it will not be able to go back, back to its original configuration. It will just sort of diverge. Like for example, the half mass fluidus will just go to infinity somehow. Um, so using this method, we are able to sort of pinpoint the eta value at which we, we start seeing dwarfs being destroyed. And for Mont, this is eta destruction about 1.5. So still about order of one, like we expected. So that is for Mont. For the CDM, we didn't perform the simulations ourselves since other people had already done that. And for that, we took a look at the Peña Rubia simulations of 2009. And yeah, what they conclude is that um, dwarf galaxies will only be significantly disturbed if their tidal radius is about the same uh, order as their half mass radius. This is that eta is about one, which is what we expected. Uh, so that's what in body simulations are telling us if we actually if, if we now compare them to what we were seeing before we see that mont is doing quite well like th this red line is showing the eta destruction estimated from in body simulations and these contour plots are the well the re in the region of values is somehow that are accepted according to observations. Uh, so yeah, MOND would perform quite well, but then the CDM is significantly, significantly below the one sigma line for eta destruction. So yeah, <laughs> that's, that's like the main conclusion. And yeah, that's the end of the talk. Uh, we just now very briefly, because I'm very out of time, summarize everything. Uh, so yes, conclusions. Um, so the observations of the dwarf, of the Fornax dwarf morphologies tell us that some are disturbed and the disturbed fraction is higher towards the center. And therefore we would expect that the main process causing this disturbance is cluster tides. And we expect that um, the tidal stability threshold should be about one. So in London CDM, we see that Fornax dwarfs should not be tidally disturbed because they, uh, their, and the tidal susceptibility is very small in this model. But observations imply that they are disturbed. I mean, we are seeing disturbed galaxies. Um, therefore, this would imply that in a London CDM context, dwarfs should be, uh, should be disturbed with an eta destruction of 0. 26, which is already very small, but if you take into account that um, tidal force scales with internal gravity as a, proportionally to eta cube, like tidal force is significantly, significantly smaller than the internal gravity when the dwarfs should be destroyed in the CDM, which doesn't make much sense. Uh, in Mond, what happens is that Fornax are expected to be disturbed. Uh, I mean, and this is because stability in this model is higher because of the external field effect and because these dwarfs don't have cold dark matter. And in this model, the, requ the required tile uh, stability limit is eta destruction 2.17 with certain error. And in body simulations imply that eta destruction is about 1.5, which is in agreement with observations. So that's that's all. <laughs> Hope that was clear. And yeah, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was this was very interesting. Um, does anybody have any questions? I guess uh, I can start with uh, one that I had and let people uh, raise their hands in the meantime. Um, uh, you you talk about the the galaxies uh, being uh, disturbed. Is this a from an observer's uh, point of view, how, how do you d define whether or not it is disturbed or not? Is there some, uh, uh, yeah, is, is there some observational thing that, that you look at or is it more of a, just a, whether or not it looks asymmetrical or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, 
I, I didn't do that classification myself. <laughs> An observer did that for me. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but yeah, I mean, the, oh, it's easier if I go back to that slide. But yeah, in principle, it's, it's mostly uh, depends, well, on the one hand, on the shape, I guess. I, it also depends on if they have substructure or something like that. Okay. Thanks. Visual. Hey, it's a, this, in this case, it's a visual classification. Visual classification. Mm -hmm. ah, yes. By done by Aku, uh, mm -hmm. the person that is referenced here. Well, this is done before the analysis. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just wondering for for my for my own uh, curiosity because. Uh, yeah. yeah it's no, he, he. Yeah, he. It's always with these galaxies, with these images, is always a good question how to. How to classify the morphology? I, I think he Aku did a lot of work on those, and he experimented back and forth about also quantifying it uh, with automatic routines and so on. And he found that in the end, for this kind of gradual classification, the the eye was was best. Um, yes, thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I see uh, Julio Navarro has his hand raised, so go ahead. Okay. Um, but thank you very much for, for uh, allowing me to ask a question and uh, pleased to meet you, Elena, as well. Thanks for the talk, it was uh, very interesting. It, is, it isn't exactly clear to me how you can be very confident about these results, right? Um, you have a basically a fractional galaxy that you deem disturbed, but you have several free parameters that one can adjust in any of the models, either in the MOND uh, model or in the lambda CBM model to, to account for those, for that observation. For example, you can tweak the percentric distances, you can see, tweak the, you know, um, the, the mass of each of the dwarfs and in ways that you cannot constrain um, observation. After all, all you know is the position today. We don't even know the velocities of this galaxy. We don't actually know the masses or the halo masses. That these uh, dwarfs would have. So, how can you be so confident that that you know Mond is preferred over lambda CDM when you have such wide um, you know uncertainties? You, you mean that uh, I mean uncertainties in the observations? You mean? Yeah. Imagine imagine every galaxy was disturbed in in the cluster. Okay. Imagine hundred percent that, that, that were disturbed. And then you say, I want to say, rule out lambda CDM as an explanation in this case, using that particular observation. But I could say, well, imagine all these galaxies have very small percentage distances, for example, in which case you'd expect basically all of them to be disturbed as well. So since we don't know the percentage distances, you just make an assumption, which is maybe reasonable, but we don't know it. Uh, how can you be confident that uh, you can prefer one explanation or the other. Um, maybe I can address this. Um, so uh, we um, th there there is of course uncertainty regarding where exactly the pericenter is. But if you go to the slide with the model parameters, um, you'll mm -hmm. see that um, we do in fact consider like a wide range of, uh, for example, distributions in the orbital eccentricity and uh, the sort of density profile of the cluster. Um, so uh, yeah, we we have um, yeah we 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 have uh, go go ahead to the next slide, um, yeah the one after. Well no uh, no the previous one is fine. Uh, yeah so uh, for example uh, the, there's a wide range of eccentricities and we're considering the dwarf at every possible like point along the orbit. Um, so of course we don't know where it is uh, on its orbit, uh, but that's why we build a forward model to try and account for these uncertainties, uh, and we try out different sort of functions in, in the right panel for how the um, for how the tidal susceptibility actually affects the likelihood of it looking disturbed. Uh, now regarding what you're asking, imagine if all the dwarfs were disturbed. Well, what would happen is the P disturbed floor would be um, basically one and there would be no tendency for the P disturbed ceiling to be higher than the P disturbed floor. Um, there'd be as many MCMC trials where the P disturbed ceiling is less as, as more. Uh, more importantly, the, there wouldn't be any preferred value of eta destruction. 
basically it won't really matter where you put it because if you have a horizontal line then it doesn't matter where this upward slope is exactly there isn't one um so essentially the model would have been able to fit with any value of eta destruction um it, it wouldn't prefer any particular value um uh, and uh ah you, you i think you're also asking how did you ask like how we were sure tides were responsible versus other effects for the disturbed morphologies um no no i didn't ask that so uh, I, i guess you know you this is as best as you can do i mean once you put so many parameters it's hard to know exactly what's what's going on here i mean i, I could suggest something perhaps that there is a bit simpler that could you know have a thing some some uh, some way of uh, discerning between the two you know in lambda cdm which is basically newtonian gravity so which is an extra mass component yeah. you have to have a very strong prediction which is where the location of the disturbance would be so for example if you take the photometry of a dwarf and you find you know this disturbance somewhere the disturbance appears as a bump in the surface brightness profile for example of the galaxy so it gives you a, a, a characteristic radius where this disturbance is right now that disturbance the location of the disturbance is uh, given by the location of the galaxy where the crossing time equals the time since the percentage passage so in other words if you have a galaxy that's been is very close to the center that the disturbance is very close to the center that Uh, if the, the same galaxy now you look at it farther away when it's like at upper center the disturbance should have moved away and may perhaps be you know impossible to find because it's it's gone beyond the, the size uh, of the galaxy so it's a very strong prediction then as to where the disturbances should be and uh, where the galaxy is in a cluster okay so you say oh the tides are important because it goes close to the center then close to the center you should observe lots of disturbances you would be easy to find them because they're in the main main part of the galaxy farther away they should be very hard to find because the disturbance has traveled outside of the region that you can you know, detect with photometry and so and by using that timing argument of the of the disturbance it be much i think much more convincing uh, to argue one case or the other and i think you have the data to do something like that so we, we have... did some simplified analysis like that actually uh, and uh, well I, i thought it was less convincing but anyway um the, the issue with what you're saying is it's very difficult to do for any individual dwarf because we don't know the um orbital history but statistically uh, you can although you don't, statistically... you don't need you don't need orbital histories right you know the distance you know the projected distance we have a minimum time that has to have elapsed you know since since the percentage the percentage is usually quite well inside the radius that you observe in a galaxy but i'm actually want to see what I, elena had to say if you don't mind uh, letting her uh, answer uh no, i mean what, what you were saying about um maybe i'm not understanding it correctly but perhaps you're asking about a test like this of projected this i mean this this is not Uh, looking at the disturbance, for example, but it's looking at what dwarfs are we actually observing as, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, depending on its uh, half mass radius as a function of R max, R max should, R max is the radius they would have if, um, in order to be observed given the limit to the surface brightness limit. So I mean, like we did well, we did that, but we didn't include it in the talk. Um, for example, with with this, we did see that there is an increase of dwarfs with larger sizes as we go farther away from the cluster center. So we, we do yeah. see this dependency with the cluster center. If right. if that's what you what you're asking, it's, a, it's something like this. I mean, it uses the photometry of the dwarf, but it's a bit more sophisticated in the sense that. You would look at each individual dwarf and you would say where is the disturbance where does this thing occur uh, because you know what you expect is that would if you perturb a dwarf it will relax it will go back to equilibrium after it's gone through the percenter and the signal that you have that has been to the percenter is like a is like a wave that propagates from the in from the inner part of the galaxy out 
All right? So inside the, that radius, the galaxy is in equilibrium. And outside the radius, it still hasn't yet reached equilibrium. So if you could track that location of that disturbance as a function of the distance to the center of the galaxy, you have a very strong prediction of whether this explanation, which of course would apply mostly to Lambda CDM, is, is a viable explanation. So it uses the, the same kind of data, but uh, in a perhaps in a more sophisticated way. But anyway, I don't want to take more of your time. Thanks again for the for the. Well, maybe I can just briefly say something about this. Um, I think this is actually a very good idea, um, but I'm not sure it requires the same data we have. It, if I understood correctly, it requires sort of higher resolution images of the dwarf. Um, but personally, my understanding is this, this is actually a very good idea, but it's much more likely to work uh, probably for dwarfs uh, around the Milky Way, where you would have much better uh, in information about like individual orbital histories and much deeper images. Because for that, you don't need like hundreds of dwarfs, only a few dozen might suffice, and maybe. Well, it is surprisingly difficult to do in a Milky Way, even for the best dwarfs. Uh, the orbit itself is very poorly characterized. I'll give you an example. Fornax, we have hundreds of you know, velocities measured. We have exquisite proper motions measured. But because of uncertainties in the potential and also uncertainties in the distance of Fornax, we don't know the percent of Fornax to better than factor two. So it could be a hundred kiloparsecs, or it could be, you know, forty kiloparsecs, and no, both I, are perfectly, this, you know, uh, allowable. So it's actually surprisingly difficult, difficult to do with, but hang on, with a very few objects, and and with a precise because we don't have much measurements that are precise enough. But in a, in a cluster like Fornax, where there are you know dozens and dozens of these objects, then uh, it should be possible to do some statistics that are better than than in the Milky Way. I see. Well, maybe. I mean, of course, proper motions won't be available at all in the Fornax cluster, but no, maybe because that's why you, you don't need them. So you just do a you you just do a very projected distance, and you see, if there is a signal, you should see it. You should see that you know the signal is in the ones that are close to the center, statistically speaking, not by everyone, and that disappears as you go out towards the outskirts. No, so that is correct. I mean, uh, the uh, disturbed dwarfs are mostly close to the center. Yeah, exactly. But now, quantitatively, there's oh, actually see. quantitative statements as opposed to, but it, has exactly. to scale, it has to scale with the time it takes from a guy, for, for a dwarf to go from the center to the outskirts. Right? So no, I think I understand. It's, it's more detailed than what we've done. Um, yeah, yeah, it's more, it's much more detailed. But I, I think you have the data, you have good photometry for these things. So I think it's, it's possible. It's a lot of work, but it's possible. Maybe. Yeah. I hate to interrupt, but uh, we have uh, another question. So. Uh, uh, from Pavel Krupa, so go ahead. Uh, you can ask a question. Yeah, hello. Um, I was just, you know, related to this discussion um, in um, in the dark matter framework, the um, dwarf galaxies would be sh are shielded by the dark matter by their dark matter halo. So if the dark matter halo stays there um, unaffected by the orbit, then um, I guess the fraction of dwarfs being disturbed would be negligible. Uh, and so the question is, is it easy to peel away the dark matter halo through, through the tides, right? And um, um, what I see in the data is that the, the number of disturbed dwarfs is pretty large. That's what you basically have found. And um, can one then um, make that consistent with um, the orbital history of the dwarfs and then losing the dark matter halo so that they become susceptible to tidal um, perturbations. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know, do you can want to you say a few words to that maybe? Yeah, Ellen, can you show the slide with the um, dark matter, like tidal radius calculations? And you can answer this on that. Yeah, this one, I guess. Uh, no, before. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, regarding the fraction of the dark matter halo with an optical radius. So um, yeah, in, in this analysis, one assumes that the dark matter fraction remains unchanged or... Um, yes, because we, uh, yeah, but we only assumed 4% of the total dark matter halo mass for this analysis. So whether the remaining 96% actually exists or not, 
because of the shell theorem, it wouldn't actually affect our results. So you could assume that maybe 96% of the dark matter halo is stripped and our results would still be the same. Or you could assume less was stripped and it would still be the same. Well, in terms of what you're expecting lambda CDM, you're expecting lambda CDM the ties to be incredibly important, right? After all, we've had quite a lot of difficulty in the lambda CDM community to convince ourselves that substructures should remain because in the early simulations, ties were so, so incredibly effective that it, at least at low resolution, all of the substructure gets dissolved. So in lambda CDM, expect very, very strong uh, tidal effects. How strong they are, how they depend on mass, how they depend on distance, all those things are, of course, you know, much more difficult to, to estimate, but it can be done. And the effect, I mean, for example, the example we have is in, the, in our own local group, you know, where tides are pretty obvious to find, right? Look at such terrorist dwarf, for example. And as far as I can tell, the models that best, you know, describe those things actually do have dark matter. Maybe not be a complete proof that dark matter exists, but clearly not, it's not inconsistent. With, uh, with yeah, I agree. The outer part of the dark matter halo should be stripped. Um, yeah, but, but I think uh, this is not not quite correct. So um, in in the um, uh, round, satellites of the Milky Way cannot be explained with dark matter halos. They um, because the high velocity dispersions imply that they are severely dominated by dark matter, like you know, mass light ratios more than a hundred, and then they should be shielded. So. Um, the fact that nearly every dwarf shows tidal perturbation is in in strong contradiction to that, uh, and I'm not but sure. But, but, yeah, I don't understand what you mean by this should be shielded. Dark matter is this, lost like yes. any other collisionless fluid. I mean, the shield, the part that's shielded, is the region of a galaxy where the crossing time, the inner crossing time, is very very short compared to the orbital time at peri center. And. Uh, did you, did you, Julia, so it, depends. it depends on the rate, right? So yeah, this, this doesn't work because the distances of the dwarfs is too, are too large to be um, affected. If they have these high masses, it doesn't work. It's up there is center. It's up there is center that matters, not, not where they are now. They are up or center now. Most yeah, but they're, they're we have a slide perturbed. regarding this issue. Maybe you can show that one, Eleanor. <clears throat> they are too perturbed, so um, they should be as smooth as globular clusters. If you go in, to the end. In the Milky Way. Because of the yeah. high velocity dispersions, any perturbation smears out on a crossing time scale, so phase mixes away, uh, and um, and too many of them are, are really perturbed. So um, no, but not this one. Um, right at the end in the appendix. Um, so yeah, we uh, looked. Uh, there was. Go ahead. Keep going. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. No, um, so based on uh, this uh, article, um, go ahead to the next slide. Um, so I think this is what Pavel was talking about. Uh, on the left, you see the ellipticities of Milky Way satellites uh, or local group satellites uh, as a function of distance. Um, and the rather high ellipticities uh, is, I think, what he was saying is uh, very difficult to understand for dwarfs, which are not really affected by tides. No. It's, not, it, it's not just electricity. This is actually a very simplified version. Uh, you, you, they're actually substructures. So yeah. uh, clumps and um, distortions in the isophotes, um, not just electricity. So there's I, electricity in every isophote, but they're twisted and off center, um, so which, is, which doesn't make sense uh, given the high velocity distribution because they should face mix away within, I don't know. If, um, hundred, um, I don't know, dozens of millions of years, if not. So th this is what we showed on the right panel. Uh, there's a calculation of uh, the um, basically the eta value in lambda CDM, uh, and the result is very low. Uh, so indeed, you're you're correct about this that these objects shouldn't really be affected by uh, tides in lambda CDM. All right, I think we should probably end here. We're getting very close to the top of the hour, so. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Elena again for uh, her talk and the interesting discussion that uh, came from it afterwards. So um, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks. Thanks, Elena. It was wonderful talk. Thank you. Bye-bye.